Hey everybody, welcome to Saturday, November 4th. Uh, this is a look at my week in review or my week notes. Uh, this is also newsletter number 122 for Too Long Didn't Read. Sent this out yesterday afternoon. Um, a lot of interesting elements. I want to dive right in. Uh, first off, uh, I spent a little bit of time thinking this week about uh, what are the, the first principles that are, you know, part of being digitally literate. So if we were to distill down to the most basic elements, the, the skills, the knowledge, skills, and dispositions that you need to be, you know, a, a citizen of the internet, what would those things be? Um, and so I basically started out drafting these and said, you know, this is a work in progress up top. I talk about, um, you know, where this thinking comes from. And I started off with five principles. Um, and I said, by no means are these the only principles out there, but this is just my starting point to think through this. Um, and this is, uh, you know, a, a, a straw man or a straw person so that people can sort of unpack it and figure out, okay, what's in and what's out. Um, so in this week's newsletter, I not only share the uh, blog post with those, but I also shared a, a Google Doc to give you a better idea um, actually to make it easier for you to voice your opinion about what's in and out of scope. So this doc that I shared out, you had the ability to edit this. Um, and so basically I have the initial five that I have from the blog post there, but then I also have uh, the, the most recent version. So the original five down here, um, and then f with some feedback from different people, I... Uh, basically pushed it up to six principles, um, but then sent it around yesterday to a bunch of different people, got some good feedback, need to include more about the community and um, the social aspect, um, and then also got some really great feedback from Doug Belshaw. He basically looked and said two, three, five, two and three and five and six can be, um, you know, collapsed. So I'm going to take some more look, uh, some more time this week looking at this and make some more sense of it. And by all means, you can get in there as well and let me know what you think. Um, the, the, the audience for this is, you know, people that are interested in getting themselves online and trying to figure out how do I become a, you know, a real web literate citizen? Um, what are the skills and strategies I need to employ? Um, this, for me, I've been thinking about making my work more approachable and more accessible. So this is basically getting content out there so that you can do what I do um, and you can build up these skill sets and try and distill it down to what are the basic elements? Like what is the real important stuff you need to think about and be aware of as you work, as you get started and as you work. Um, so that blog post went out and sent out the Google Doc as well so that people can give feed feedback and let me know what you think. Also did a nice uh, video on showing as opposed to telling with multimodal information. Um, and this basically sets the stage for uh, screen capture, screencasts, and animated GIFs or GIFs, depending on what side of the fence you grew up on. Uh, this is something that I regularly talk about in my class. This is a 20-minute a lecture or lead-in to our work on screen captures and screencasts and everything else. And so I decided, you know, I'm just going to record it and put it out there. Uh, so it was a good opportunity to sort of make that thinking uh evident for everybody. Uh, had some nice discussions with Terry Atkinson this week, thinking about the ways in which I read and write online and, and, may, and keep track of what I'm reading online. Uh, this, a lot of this was motivated by work in previous issues of Too Long Didn't Read and also uh, previous videos about how you should and could read online. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I know that I want to put together a blog post talking about my writing process. But also, I think there is a need to have a couple of videos on a more granular level as to how I uh, read online. Uh, and so those are, are still to come. Also, had really nice uh, emails, as always, from Jamie Allen and Aaron Davis. Um, Jamie pushing me about uh, AR and VR. So uh, more information, more thinking about AR and VR yet to come. Uh, Started all off with a video from a remix from 300, uh, thinking about potential teachers. This was shared by a student in my class this week. Um, 
interesting if you're in education. It's kind of funny. It gives you a lot of good talking points to think about what to do and what not to do. Uh, this week, the New Media Consortium Horizon Project basically released their 2017 Digital Literacy Impact Study. What they're looking at is how well do we prepare students in higher ed for technology use in their careers. And so this went out uh, this week. Uh, I was on the editorial board for this report, so I saw it before it was released and gave a little bit of feedback. Um, Brian Alexander was on that group as well. Uh, but, you know, really they did, they did really good work, and it was thinking about their framing of digital literacy and thinking about whether or not students felt like they were prepared. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about it and, and gave a lot of feedback in there, uh, but I think for the most part the, the report stands on its own, so I urge you to go in and take a look. And, and the, the real value to me is uh, it, as we think about teaching and learning contexts, as we think about learning environments, we often think about you know technology use. Are we really preparing students or are we just... Uh, you know, do we think we know what students need and what students want? My mentality is that we usually do not and we're not doing enough. But this is a good way to look at what different universities and institutions are doing and then what value the students see in that. So it's a good way to sort of calibrate what you're doing. Uh, beyond that, a terribly in interesting report from the Cato Institute thinking about uh, free speech, hate speech, tolerance, uh, college campuses, and beyond. Uh, very long, very interesting, a lot of details in there. Um, and one of the reasons why I've been interested in this is I've been looking at some of the hate speech and, and discriminatory practices that we have online in these social spaces and thinking about, you know, not that I feel that they should, but, you, you know, should there be a change in, in freedom of speech? You know, should there be a, a terms of use or a terms of service um, as we see these activities? Um, I don't think so, but you have to wonder and you have to ask yourself as you see some of these actions occurring and, and some of this dialogue that's happening online, um, should something be done about it? Should we sort of, how do we establish or determine what the best practices are or how just to be nice to other people online. So a lot of really interesting um, data in this. And I think it's important, you know, as I think and wonder about freedom of speech and these hate practices, um, it was interesting to get in there and have uh, a look at what the results of this, of this Cato Institute report suggest. Um, you know, uh, like I said, a very long, very detailed, very interesting report. Um, definitely need to take some time to, to think through it. I had some of the top level things as I as I unpacked it, but there's a lot of interesting stuff in there about um, different diverse practices, uh, different diverse in individuals and groups, and the way they view these practices. Um, and then it, it it goes on from there to a very granular level. So definitely. Take some time over a series of days, possibly, to, to unpack this report. I think it's important for all of us um, to make sense of what these results might suggest. Earlier in this, I talked about, you know, I provided the Google Doc for my blog post and allowed you to give your uh, feedback. Uh, this is another element of the uh, audience participation stage of the, the newsletter. Um, so earlier in the week, I sent out this post. Uh, New York Times had an interesting uh, piece on how to fix Facebook, and they asked nine experts in the field. And so right after sharing it out, uh, Robin DeRosa and others popped up and said, you know what, Like we need to think about this. We need to talk about it. I would really enjoy having dialogue with you know, people about this um, because I'm not really sure what to think about it. And let's get a bunch of people in the room and let's talk about what this suggests. Um, and so, you know, it, the, the Twitter conversation is is online. You can go see who is involved. But there is a lot of, you know, I really don't want to sit on a hangout or don't want to sit on a phone call. Um, I don't have the headspace for that right now. But you know what? Like, let's have, you know, maybe like a slow read. Let's have a place, you know, that we 
can sort of take our time. And so a couple of people suggested dropping this thing in hypothesis and taking time to add comments and feedback um, and, and make sense of it. So what we have in that link there is we drop that Facebook piece into hypothesis. And so this is really nice for a couple different levels. One, it allows us to take our time and sort of think through the, the different points and have dialogue, have you know comments about the text based on the text. So this is the um, you know news article. It's in hypothesis. Um, you can tell that it's in hypothesis because you'll see this via hypothesis at the beginning of the URL. And so this is really nice for a different reason. Um, for those of you that are trying to see a really good use case for hypothesis, this is it right here. So I'd urge you to, to click on over and get involved. So I can, you know, I'm in Chrome. I can see that I'm logged into hypothesis now. Um, you know, if I click this little slide out bar, so one is you have to have hypothesis installed in your browser. And I think if you have this link, you don't even need to. But the nice thing is that you can see that there's a lot of comments in here uh, from people. So there's a, a comment or two that I have in there. There's other comments and feedback that people have. Um, so there's 50 comments already in the document. And if you scroll through, you can see a lot of these comments and feedback and, and, and you know you can respond to what we have to say there. So to figure out how to use this, Hypothesis, what it'll do is once it's installed, you'll see this little slide, this little slide out bar. And what I can do is if I highlight a piece of text, Hypothesis is acting a little bit wacky right now. I think it's that I'm recording and, you know, have this Facebook page for some reason doesn't like it. I mean, this uh, New York Times page doesn't really like it. If I am trying to use Hypothesis with it, I noticed that it was a little bit wonky the other day. I'm wondering if they're doing stuff on their end to sort of block us from uh, leaving comments. I know that they have their own comment machine put in there, but I prefer this this open version. So it's acting a little bit wacky right now. Let's try one more time. Come on. Come on, New York Times. I think New York Times doesn't want to play nice with us right now. All right, so I'm going to back out of this. Um, definitely check it out on your end. Um, this is something that I have videos about how to use Hypothesis, but by all means, and I link um, my video and my post on how to use it, by all means, get in there, take a look at it, um, you know, get involved in the discussion. It's a good use case for Hypothesis. It's an important topic that's not easy to understand, and as they, as uh, Robin and others suggested, we needed a slow read and discussion on it. Um, this week, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and others went into uh, D.C. to testify before Congress to talk about um, these Russian bots and ha hacks and mis- and disinformation and the, the trolls and the ads and everything else in between and the stuff we don't even know about, the dark ads. Um, and they basically testify, and Ben Thompson from Stratechery definitely follow both if you don't already, but has a really nice piece basically synthesizing what we learned or what we think we learned. And some of this stuff is really interesting, and some of it's a surprise, and some's not a surprise. Apparently what is a surprise to um, you know a, a lot of senators is how vast and broad the reach is for Facebook and Google and Twitter. Um, you know, several times Facebook would re would report on their users or the reach of these ads, and they were just sort of like shocked and um, repeating the numbers um, that were provided. So, but the, the truth of the matter is that you know there was a lot of there was a lot of disinformation that had a, a wide reach in these events. And we have to figure out what to do about that. You know, we we see it in current elections um, as people go out to the polls or as they're about to go to the polls, 
I can see, you know, there's a, uh, an election coming up in Virginia here in the U.S. soon. And this morning I woke up and the news said that the bots are coming. The bots are swarming in, you know, and, and these bots are ads and dark ads. And there's a lot of like mis and disinformation that's swelling up in people's social network feeds um, to sort of get them to show up to the polls or not show up to the polls or vote or not vote vote or vote a certain way. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, propaganda that's being used uh, surreptitiously to make people think and act in different ways. Um, and so to me, this is a poison. This is something that we need to figure out how to address. And this to me is also the new normal. Um, and so something that we have to unpack uh, as a civilization, as a society, as a as a global community, but also what do we do in our classrooms? Um, uh, as usual, Ben Thompson is a, a deep thinker on these subjects, and one of the things that he says in there that that has me thinking as well is, you know, Facebook and Google and Twitter, they're in this weird situation where one, they have a, a fiduciary responsibility, they have shareholders that they got to. They have to make sure they do the, the most they can to make money. But then there are also this social network, this social commons. Um, and they have to pay attention to the fact that they really are, you know, a, a new public space, even though it's in a digital space. They're a new public area. Um, you know, the amount of people that's on Facebook, for as an example, is is larger than populations of, of many countries. Um, and so they are a public space where... We have to pay attention to what people are doing and thinking and, and help them be the most thoughtful individuals. Um, at the same time, uh, Facebook and Google and Twitter and a lot of these companies don't want to be, they, they say they believe in net neutrality, but they don't really want to be the, you know, uh, evaluators um, of information online. They don't want to be the ones that have to sort of say yes or no, this is what you should read or shouldn't read. Um, and I agree with that. But we have to have more dialogue about what's acceptable and what's not and who should be making these decisions. Um, you know, yes, we need to figure out how do we inform people and educate them so that they don't look at bogus information and uh, make decisions about it. But I think that, you know, there's got to be a better way. and We're not on that current path. Um, while we're on that subject, uh, a lot of the Russian ads and bots that were used in the presidential election that like swayed people and really went viral um, were released this week. And so really recommend going in and clicking through and, and checking out some of the ads that we're talking about here. Um, anecdotally, I saw a lot of this um, in discussions leading up to the U.S. political uh, presidential election. And, you know, I would talk to neighbors and I'm sitting there worrying about a lot of different issues and, and considerate about a lot of issues. And then I would talk to my neighbor that would say, oh, look at this. This is saying that, you know, and, and he would basically report on a story that he read online. And it was just ridiculous. Um, it was almost like sophomore, um, the the news that he was very interested in. And that was in, that was really motivating him to go vote. And. You know, he would have ridiculous stories about uh, a candidate being, you know, an alcoholic and drunk all the time or mentally ill or, you know, uh, you know, and he would read this to me and he's like, oh, we need to do something about this. And I was like, number one, like, what are you reading? Number two, where did you get that source from? And it was interesting because in those instances, right after that discussion, I, I went back to my computer and I'm I'm actively searching and actively Googling to find this information and read this story, and I can't find it. And so I was sort of wondering, okay, like I, I saw the, the information, I saw the story, I know what it's about, and I'm Googling to find it, and I cannot find this. What's going on? Um, and now, many months later, we know what's going on. Um, this is the, the ads and the dark ads and the misinformation. Um, Thinking more about data points, a uh, really nice piece that Mozilla sent out about how connected uh, you are and, and trying to figure out what this all means. Um, and, and, you know, a couple different takeaways from this. One, 
The world's pretty evenly divided between fear and optimism for a connected future. We talked about this in the past um, from the Pew reports uh, from a week or two ago. People are afraid of losing privacy. Um, one of the things that's really stuck out for me is people aren't really sure who to trust. Uh, people aren't sure who to trust, what institutions to trust, um, and they also don't know, to me this also means they don't know um, where to go to for guidance on this. So if they want to figure out how to build their skill set, who do they talk to, where do they go? Um, it really has me thinking, um, but more to come. Great piece um, from Steve Brophy and others, uh, and it's basically talking about a good memory hack um, you know, called the generation effect. Uh, for those researchers out there, this is a nice PDF I dropped in there for you to check out. Um, but it's basically, and this is nothing new for teachers, this is a, a reading strategy. Um, that's not a big surprise, but just a reminder of its use and value uh, in our classrooms and in our own lives. And what they're talking about is the generation effect. So, you know, we're active learners, and instead of just learning, uh, our brains are not sponges. So to, to really learn and make sense of the world, you know, see one, do one, teach one. So see something in action. And that includes YouTube. I watch a bunch of YouTube videos, obviously. And, you know, see it in action. See it happening. Um, do it. Uh, make something happen. Try to make it happen, even if it doesn't work. And then teach somebody else how to do it. And that's really how to make it um, stick. Um, great quote by Brené Brown. Uh, Maybe stories are just data with a soul. Uh, a good way to wrap up our work for this week. Uh, and once again, um, that's pretty much the end of the week. Um, you know, this is uh, the end of, you know, the, today's November 4th. Uh, it's a good way to wrap up the week uh, and think through some of these elements. Um, some work on the on the back burner for me, a couple things that are, are simmering at the front of the stove and, and ready to come off soon. Um, but for the most part, it's a, a really good week, a lot, of, a lot of different elements, a lot of things happening all at once. Um, so hopefully this is a good way to wrap up the week for you and make sense of the week that was. Uh, once again, my name is Ian O'Byrne. Hopefully this was beneficial for you. Um, this is all from my newsletter, Too Long Didn't Read. Uh, you can find my information over at my blog at wioburn.com. And by all means, if the newsletter would help you, um, head on over to wioburn.com slash tldr, too long didn't read. Basically, too long didn't read is all about making you the expert, helping you build up the skill set, giving you materials at the end of the week to sit down and say, okay, like I want to build up expertise in education, technology, uh, literacy, and learning. What are the things that I really need to learn? What are the things I really need to know? So that's there for you. So by all means, subscribe, pay attention, subscribe to this uh, YouTube channel. Give me thumbs up, thumbs down. And for that, um, I'll be very grateful. Thanks once again. Have a great day and uh, I'll see you.